Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, what is up? I am live from the Blizzard campus. Look at me. Look at this beautiful room. Look at that dog that's going to be there for the entire duration of this stream. Uh, this is the fancy schmancy community streaming room that Blizzard has so kindly lent to me because uh, they invited me down to do the Hearthstone card reveal stream, which just finished, which was awesome because... I don't, know, I don't know how it couldn't be. Unless the cards were like, and we added another 4-5 for 4 mana. Unless they were just like really bland cards, it was bound to be exciting. So I was excited, but on Fridays I normally stream, and they suggested that I stream literally right here. Uh, I think the thing that I'm most excited about as well is that um, I got to wear the I Slappa De Bass shirt, but the bottom was cut off during the stream. So I'm sitting there like talking to Peter Whalen about all his designs and motivations and all that shit. And I just have like I Slappa up here and you can't you can't actually see Da Bass below. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, this also this audio equipment is like crazy sensitive. We can do all sorts of sweet things. So I I mean I don't like having this giant dangling mic in front of me. This, this actually feels like the feeling I have is like if you're at a petting zoo and one of the animals just really wants to meet you and gets really close to your face. I could kind of have this whoa kind of sensation, but that's okay. It's okay. I'm a professional. I'm going to work through it. What I want to do, what I want to do is do a little bit of review of the cards because we're going to play Hearthstone in a moment, but let's be honest. Let's be honest. Swamp King Dread. Pretty sick. Um... I'm going to give my brief reactions. I mean, you saw a lot of them on the card reveal stream, but here's the thing. Card games obviously involve lots of interactions between parts, and it gets presented as a one-at-a-time reveal. Um, and so, I mean, like this card here, I really can't think of as just being the individual card, and I've had at most 10 additional minutes to think about it, and I'm just going to give some initial reaction thoughts. And I was talking a little bit about this on the show that um, I got to kill Hearthstone. I got to kill it. I was talking about this on the show we just did that it's so hard to ever be correct with predictions because I can only really get a sense of cards relative to the meta I'm in right now, not what the meta will be. Because if you will recall, aggro, like ultra aggro pirate was not really a thing before Mean Streets of Gadgetson. Jade was really not a thing. And the Reno decks were more sort of interesting and cute than they were the final boss style things. And those I would describe as the three dominant archetypes in the metagame right now. And so whenever I was seeing the cards, I was like relating them to this, right? Like, oh, we see Dragon Priests a lot. Imagine if you played Swamp King Dread. That priest is gonna get shit on, right? I was thinking things like that, but I don't necessarily know if... Um, there will even be Dragon Priest. I mean, hell, there's 120 cards unrevealed. Um, so what we're going to do is we're still going to totally make predictions because it's fun as hell. I want so badly for Hunter Control to be a thing. I so, so badly want Hunter Control to be a thing. Um, I have tried so many times, you know. Every single time it ends up being, I put in some cards to help delay the game. And I can still just kill him on turn nine. So <laughs> maybe Swamp King Dread will be good. I think the big problem with um, any single control hunter deck ever is that it's just so hard to draw cards. It's so unbelievably, ridiculously hard to draw cards. Um, Arcanologist. I, I actually think that I misevaluated this initially because. When I was looking at this for the first time earlier today, I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to absolutely go into these mass pre... pre, pre talking sucks! Oh my gosh, man. I have been talking for days. Let me do this. Mm. Earlier on, I was thinking, oh, okay, there's those mass secret mage decks that I've tried. I think I even did a show where I tried that. Um, and it was just inconsistent as all hell. It, it it was a big old pile of donkey butt. Um, 
it was very spiky. You know, sometimes like turn one Cabal Lackey, get a free secret. Turn two, coin out a Kirin Tor Mage, play a secret. And then I was sort of out. I was out of juice. And I think that this is a really nice specific thing for those kinds of decks. But honestly, the old mass secret mages that I've tried have just been bad. Um, or I should not say bad. They've been non-competitive. <laughs> I'm not gaining stars at rank 16 when I'm doing them, so um, I went ahead and chucked that one out. Um, so this might be the thing that smooths it, but I think that um, the thing that Peter said at the very end, Arcanologist is just great in a control deck as a way to draw an extra card that you often desperately need. Like if you are running two ice blocks in some kind of non-Reno mage, Having an Arcanol just to just guaranteed draw a secret is super nice for consistency, right? You have, like, four ways to draw an ice block. The two ice blocks or two Arcanologists. Uh, this card I feel completely neutral about. I go, okay, this is fine. This could be an all-star, but that's only if the pirate decks are still running rampant. And if the pirate decks are running rampant... It means that they're good despite Galaka Crawler being there. So I, I, I this is something that I, I talked about in the good old StarCraft two days. The uh, maybe you haven't played StarCraft, I strongly recommend co-op. It's so good. Um, in the good old Day Nine Daily days, there's a thing I talked about which is like an invisible wall, which is that there are some units that you don't see. Like there were uh, in the Wings of Liberty era, especially Hydralisks were not particularly used very much. Uh, in Zerg versus Protoss. But there were certain plays that Protoss couldn't make because it would just lose immediately to Hydralisks, and it was very, very easy. So this this is the sort of thing that I almost feel like if it's good enough against pirates, it just kind of deletes pirate decks from the meta, and we see neither pirates nor Galaka crawlers. Um, I think that there is some potential for it to be a cool tech card, maybe, if, say, Naga Corsairs, the 5-4 the four for 4 that gives your weapon plus 1 attack, if there's those high-value pirates that are run not in a mass pirate deck, but as very specific pirates, that this actually makes the most sense. Like, if there are some really good legendary pirates, that might be cool. Um... This also might be cool as a turn two play in a pirate deck. Actually, that's an interesting thought. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if this buffed pirates? Ah! Oh, let's just stretch. Oh! I like being in a room. And I love how deep this room is, man. It looks like I'm sitting here from Command HQ. Oh, man. It's just like, oh, the Galaka Crawler that destroys a pirate and gives plus one, plus one is so powerful in pirate decks. Oh, it can't be stopped. Oh, we hit the singularity in 2017 when Galaka Crawlers were introduced to the meta and Pirate Dex became self-aware. At least the Trailblazer... I, I, I said this on stream. I, I really don't know what to think about this card. Um, historically, I have not been a fan of the... Do, do some random shit cards. Like... Add three random mage spells to your hand. Because I don't really know what I'm preparing against. Um, but then there are some other random effect things that feel great to me. Like um, uh, uh, Dark Peddler. Dark Peddler feels great. Um, and by the way, if any of you haven't seen this... I actually realize that some of you are tuning in right now. You've never seen these cards before. Um, this card, you actually open up a pack in the game and you add those five cards to your hand and most of the time there's a legendary in there. This is Elise the Trailblazer. It's kind of like Elise the RNG Maker. Transform your deck into legendaries. So I I, I don't know it like okay so so let me let me give my, my, my brief comments on randomness. Okay so there, there's random cards that I really like which would be like Dark Peddler. There's a very confined set of one mana things um, that are expectable and sort of controlled. I feel like I can prepare against it. There's things like Renounce Darkness that are just ridiculous and not particularly good. And I love I, I love Renounce Darkness. I think it's a fun, fun, fun card. 
fun, 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 fun. But I do. I'm actually gonna take these off, man. It is so hot in here. I I do think that like it's those on the edge, potentially powerful, but more potentially just high variance that kind of make me go ah, like. Add a random spell to your hand, babbling book. Add three random mage spells to your hand, Cabal's Tome. These are the ones that have kind of given me this uh, reaction because they can be powerful in a way where I, the recipient, can't really plan around it. Um, and I don't know if at least the Trailblazer will have this kind of feel. I don't know. I think that overall it might be just a solid card to include and in if there are a lot of control decks in the meta. Just a good can control meta breaker. Oh, 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 oh. This says shuffle a sealed Ungoro pack into your deck, and this is the the card. Oh, oh, oh my god, I almost had a heart attack. I thought I revealed a card that Blizzard didn't intend to have revealed. Because when I got here, I got, I got nothing. I got no anything. I didn't get any information. We didn't talk about exactly what would be shown and when and what the mechanics would be and uh, none of that. It was it was pretty much just ad libbed. And so when I saw this one, I was just like, "Oh my god, they actually gave me the wrong PNGs." Tar Creeper. I I feel like it will be as exciting as Second Rate Bruiser, where it feels like it will be a good tech card and it's just kind of like a solid solid little card. I mean, solid little card. I think it's it's relatively unexceptional in terms of uh, its ability to get me all mouth watering and foot cramping and back arching. Mm. <laughs> Tar Creeper, aka Elite Rager. <laughs> oh man, savage. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I feel just fine about this. Now, now here is a card that I have no clue what to think about. Because here's an, here's an example of what I mean. In general, having one card be a 10 mana or an 8 mana 10 damage to the face. This good. Pyroblast is a runnable card at 10 mana. Um, not super common by any means but it, it's runnable and pyroblast was a two of when it was eight mana in like aggro and control decks if you if you recall um and so blizzard made pyroblast go from eight to ten because that was so strong and i think that in the current meta currently i feel like i would look at dinosize and go oh well dude come on anything can happen decks can get a burst of a bazillion and dino size why would i run dino size when i could instead run anything can happen but i'm imagining if the meta was less bursty and maybe uh or w w i should say if the anything can happen decks somehow reduce in popularity this can be a nice way to get a one card boom of damage Because I think that um, one charge minion that's cheap and dino size, or even way more simpler, I have a 1-1 one, one on the board with a super controly paladin. So I think that there's merit here, I guess I'd say. Um, DJ Rotor says, but anything is rotating out. Well, I mean, like, um, I actually thought that it was one more set to go. My bad. Just just so everyone knows, I have not taken a single look at what cards are rotating out. I, I have not at all. Um, it will occur to me that a card is leaving, but I, I, have, I have not done that exercise. I have not gone, oh shit, these cards are leaving, these cards are leaving. So, um, I, thought, I thought anything stayed a bit, but apparently I'm wrong. No, no big deal. But I think that this, you know, for instance, if there are less huge combo-y burst things and there's more of a whittling down that occurs, it's really nice to be able to deal 10 damage as 
a Paladin late game. Especially because you can have a true silver champion or an Ashbringer up. So you thought that Force of Nature Savage Roar was annoying at the 14 health? Well, I can imagine kind of something similar happening here where you deal 5 damage with the Ashbringer, 10 damage with the Dynasize. So I, I, I think, again, I, I would describe a lot of these as having really interesting merit to them. Um, except for that Warlock one. I think that one is fucking tight. Tortolan. <laughs> Tortilla Shell Razor. Um, I, on stream, I think I had the most confused reaction to this because I saw this and this is one of those cards that on its own does not do a lot, right? Like, like this card, Dynasize, it can be thought of at, on its own. You can only play it and something for two mana on the same turn. That's it. That's the only thing you can do. Um... So I can think about it as what I want to play it for a creature, what I want to play it to burst someone down, so on and so forth. Um, this card is like, man, I really got to stop and think super hard about what deck this card would even live in. Um, and by even live in, I don't mean, oh, it's so hard to think of one because it seems so bad. I mean, like, it's there are so many key cards rotating out for Priest. Like, Blackrock Mountain is gone. Your dragons gone. They're gone. So I mean, maybe maybe the tortilla shell razor will be uh, really good, and then it gives a random friendly minion plus one plus one. Uh, so maybe this is a way to kind of have a board controly priest that isn't dragon, uh, and you can zoth it. Uh. I don't know. I don't know. I don't really know what to think about this one because I think that. Flatly, there are so many cards rotating out of some critical, um, rotating out of the critical dragon package for priests. That I don't know. There's this funny thing where, like, who who here who here played Magic the Gathering? Raise your hand. Who here's played it? Raise raise your dongers. Um, one of the first sets where I was ever really getting into Magic, like super hardcore, was Avicenna Restored. Um, and, yes, look at all those dongers being raised. Yeah, so, like, Avacyn Restored uh, had miracle cards. It had some pretty insane effects for low mana. And shortly thereafter came Return to Ravnica, which um, had lots of cards that were, like, two colors, you know, that cost some red mana, some green mana, this sort of thing. And in Magic the Gathering, it's very hard to have red mana and green mana, to have two different manas at the same time. And Hearthstone is just mana. But in Magic, you have like blue, white, red, green, black mana. And you construct your deck to align with that. So I'll have some blue and some black cards and some blue and some black mana in my deck. So these combo cards can be quite powerful. Um, but, or I should say the, these multicolor cards can be quite powerful. And because that was one of the early sets that I was super into, I drafted that like five or six times a week. I did a lot of Return to Ravnica. I just got these ideas of power levels jammed into my head. And then when I started to play in the more standard sets, when they were still doing, you know, like M14, M15 in that era, I would see these cards that just looked weak to me. They just felt weak. They felt like they sucked. And as it turns out, they were just great, solid, solid cards. They were worse relative to some of the Return to Ravnica cards, certainly, but they were really good relative to everything else in, in the meta. And so this is the sort of card that makes me go, shit, I really have no clue what the hell this is going to look like. Because, oh yeah, a 2-6 taunt for 4. There's like a 3-6 Priest of the Feast for 4 with a nice healing effect. There is, hell, even like the 3-6 Cthulhu card for Priest for 4 that gets plus 1, plus 1 every time you heal it. Oh, what about the stats, man? Oh, this doesn't seem so good, especially when you compare it to some of the mid-range power cards, but all those are gone. So I, of all the cards here, this is the one I have least of a sense of what the hell to do with it. Um, I feel like that this will either be a super staple card that, like, tons of Priest decks use, or at least some archetypes use hardcore, or it'll just never get played. I don't know, I feel like the full range of possibilities is possible. Now, Sherizen. Oh, God, we're going to stretch so much. Oh. I, I woke up at 4.15 this morning and then went to the uh, 
airport for a 6 a.m. flight that landed at 7.30. Then I drove here, prepared for the stream, did the 11 a.m. stream. So I'm a little tired. Now this card, this card's tight. So the way it works is when it dies, you get a seed that appears on the battlefield. Let me... So this seed appears on the battlefield, and if you play four cards, it comes back like this. And the seed is untargetable, invincible. It takes up a slot. Um, I, I think that this card intrigues me. The power level overall feels very low on this. You know, the, the four mana 5-4 that comes in Tomb Pillager is tight. Is Tomb Pillager rotating out? Um... I think, no, Tomb Pillager is the museum one, isn't it? Is Tomb Pillager getting out of there? Damn. Yeah, I don't know. It, feel, it, it, it feels weak to me because it seems easy to remove as a 5-3. And then it's hard to revive, and then it would feel easy to remove again as a 5-3. So I, I don't I don't know. Oh, that's right. League of Explorers and Black Rock Mountains rotating out. Well, let me just do my usual thing. And Where's... Oh, no. Where's that? Ah. Oh. It feels nice. It feels nice to chill for a moment. So, I mean, I think that this design is absolutely fascinating. I think it's a super-duper, mega-hyper-fascinating design. I would love to see more dormant things on the battlefield. Uh, I think the this really excites me because it's kind of like having a graveyard. And if you've played Magic the Gathering, the graveyard is one of the coolest places in the entire game. So many mechanics of like, you know, when, when this is in the graveyard, you can exile it to put plus one, plus one counters of your creatures or pay this mana cost, return this to your hand, or are going to play this creature, return that from the graveyard to the battlefield. Super cool. Th this, I think, is my favorite card that I saw. Because this is discard six cards, reward a nether portal. And the nether portal is nowhere to be found. Okay, so a nether portal... Oh, let me oh, bring this back to our climbing position. So Nether Portal is an invincible card. It sits on the, the board, and every turn it summons two three twos. Um, I think this is really, really, really cool. You can just start to play a whole bunch of super aggressive discardy cards, and then you just get this portal up, and it's just like, bam, 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 continually endless summoning of three twos. And given that the discard lock has been pretty reasonable, um, Rene Liel says, can you silence the portal? No, you cannot. It's untargetable, uninteractable, just summons. It's really, really cool. And I think that's really powerful, but also feels... It feels reasonable. Because discarding six cards is tough. I was also amazed when Peter said that there's one quest card per class. There's nine quests and nine legendaries. Damn. Lakari Fellhound. Taunt, Battlecry, discard two random cards. I think that alone this card is not good. If there's more discard synergy, then okay. Um, I don't... Is Fist of Jaraxxus rotating out? I, I feel like I'm obligated to find that out. Fist of Jaraxxus. You face the Fist of Jaraxxus. No, it's it's TGT. Mm, okay. So I think we actually get to keep Fist of Jaraxxus. Is TGT or... Oh gosh, I keep... Can't keep track of which one's coming in and going out. I gotta look at this. This is this is just lead clown man thing. TGT's rotating out, man. TGT, Black Rock Mountain, and League of Explorers. I gotta just keep saying that to myself. These are the cards that are leaving. Because I mean, basically, <laughs> my experience playing Hearthstone is the set comes out and I just buy a lot of packs and then I own everything. And I'm like, la la la. 
I build the deck. And that's it. It's my entire life, and it's fantastic. This is going to be lead clown deck. All right. Delay, delay, delay. Is that all of it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven from heaven. Well, bam. I'm still reclined, which is dangerous because as a sleepy person, maybe I'll, maybe I'll pass out. Maybe I'll pass out on the stream. It'll be fantastic. Uh, let's see if my Hearthstone's up and running. Yeah, preview editor. Now, what I'm going to be doing is just playing some nice, wholesome, relaxing Hearthstone at this point in time. So that's been my little preliminary card review. Overall, um, I'm super excited because I think that a lot of the effects seem big. You know what I mean? There's a lot of bigness to, to the effects. I mean, most notably, the quest cards create really significant things. Um, and... I'll contrast this with the Grand Tournament, which had Joust and Inspire, which felt relatively not big. Like, Inspire, gain plus one attack. This is like a very gradual, you can inspire several times, and we kind of want to make sure the value's good, or um, Joust, like, hey, this thing is a little below average, and if you win the Joust, it becomes a little above average. It wasn't this this splashy, hugey, spike of moment thing and and that's something that like emotionally i look for a lot in the game and also something that is strategically very interesting too so uh i'm very excited i probably probably one of the most excited that i've been um about a set yeah yeah i really think quests are quests are getting me wiggly quests are getting me going so i'm, I'm gonna do this for a moment i'm gonna do this then he wants to play some Hearthstone. 